Good evening. My name is Richard Monsbach. As current president of the ISU chapter of the Venerable Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, I have the pleasure uh, and privilege to introduce uh, Michael Deem, who is at Iowa State as one of the 2012-13 Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholars. Professor Deem is the John W. Cox Professor of Bioengineering and a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Rice University. He is a computational theorist whose work has contributed significantly to our understanding of key aspects of immunology, evolution, and material science. He researches Newton's laws of biology, the theory of personalized critical care, physical theories of pathogen evolution, and the structure of zeolites. I don't know what he does in his spare time. <laughs> he has shown that the speed at which life evolves is constantly increasing because of horizontal gene transfer and created, he's created a database of more than four million possible molecular configurations uh, for zeolites. He will discuss methods he has developed for predicting vaccine effectiveness and for determining which strains of the flu to cover in annual vaccine formulations. Professor Deem received his Bachelor of Science at California Institute of Technology in 1991 and his doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley three years later. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, the American Physical Society, the Biomedical Engineering Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His honors include a Sloan Foundation Fellowship the Camille Dreyfus Teaching Scholar Award, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Colburn Award for Excellence in Publications, as well as the Professional uh, Progress Award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineering, and the O'Donnell Award from the Academy of Medicine, Engineering, and Science of Texas. He gave the Vaughan Lectures at Caltech in 2007 and was chosen one of MIT's Technology Review 1999 Young Innovators. He is an associate editor of, of physical biology. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Dean. Well, thanks to Phi Beta Kappa for having me here and to the university for hosting me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to visit the university. I think this is my first trip to the university itself, although I've been to the state before. I'll talk about evolution within your own immune system uh, and then also evolution within the bacterial uh, or uh, viral pathogens that might be attacking us as a population. Uh, and this is work done by a number of the people in the group. So uh, John Quay, he, he was a graduate student. Uh, he then went on to do a postdoc at Stanford. He's now a professor of physics in Shenzhen, right across from Hong Kong. Uh, John Man Park is a longtime collaborator. He's a professor in Korea Kao Pan was a graduate student. He's now a postdoc at MIT. Uh, Carlos Rojo, he was an undergraduate at Rice, and he's now a graduate student. Actually, he's a medical student at University of California, San Francisco. And Enrique Munoz, he was a student who got a degree both in bioengineering and in physics and astronomy, two PhDs, and he's now a professor of physics in his native Chile. So, I like to start off by telling you the grand challenges that were identified in global health. Uh, I'll then move on and talk for a bit about influenza. I'll describe a theory for how your immune system responds to a vaccine and then how you respond later on to a virus that might be a little bit different from the vaccine. I'll describe this order parameter P epitope. That's a good measure of the distance between a vaccine and a virus. I'll describe how this is a useful tool for development of vaccines and also how this theory can be placed in the context of epidemiology, so how the virus spreads from person to person and how it evolves as it infects a population. <clears throat> I'll then talk about detection of the emergence of new strains of viruses, uh, and then I'll move on to dengue fever. I'll talk a bit about uh, some of the issues with the vaccines for dengue fever and how we might design better vaccines. And I'll conclude with a discussion of CRISPR, which is the immune system in bacteria. So even bacteria have an immune system. This is, a, this is where my office is now. The previous picture was in our older building. This is our new building. My office is somewhere here on the seventh floor. Uh, and we have a new program. 
in systems and synthetic and physical biology that I want to mention. So especially for the undergraduates, if you're interested in these newer areas of uh, engineering and math and, and physics, systems, synthetic, and physical biology is a pretty active area. Uh, this is a PhD program we started at Rice, and we're really looking for very good undergraduates uh, to join this program, and they can work with any of 35 or so faculty from about eight departments at Rice. So <clears throat> coming back to the grand challenges in global health, about 10 years ago now, Bill Gates announced a funding initiative to identify the grand challenges in global health. And about 20 people from 13 countries were tasked with this goal of identifying those grand challenges. They received suggestions from people all over around the world. They got about 8,000 suggestions. And there were a couple criteria. The first was that these should be areas that were really not under study at that time. <clears throat> so cancer is obviously a grand challenge, but really we've been studying that for a long time, so it's not on this list. Uh, and then secondarily, sort of as a corollary of this first criterion, uh, these should be challenges that, if addressed, may particularly impact lesser developed countries. So they, and they distill these suggestions down to the 14 that you see here. And what I like to point out is that six out of the 14 grand challenges in global health are related to vaccines. So three of them are related to childhood vaccines. For example, how can you give children uh, vaccines, especially when they're infants? An the issue there is infants don't really have an immune system that's too activatable until they're four to six months old. Uh, and then three of the grand challenges are related to adults. So can we design better tests in model systems to evaluate vaccines? And you might think this probably would be animal models, but if we had enough theory, this could be a theoretical test. Uh, an engineering type of challenge is can we design better antigens that give us better vaccines? And then a sort of complementary scientific question is can we understand more about what it is in the immune system that's giving us that protective immunity. So vaccines are important, and this is largely what I'll talk about. How can we design better vaccines uh, or new vaccination strategies or new protocols for administering vaccines? <clears throat> I'll focus on the flu in the first part of my talk. The annual influenza uh, does have a certain mortality, uh, but really perhaps what most of us are familiar with is 5 to 15 percent of the population does get the flu every year. There's some argument about what the mortality actually is. The number you'll typically hear is about 36,000, uh, but it's really hard to know exactly what the mortality is because on death certificates, really, it's influenza and pneumonia that is most commonly reported. Uh, and for influenza and pneumonia, that is roughly the seventh most common cause uh, of mortality in the U.S. This is from a few years ago. Uh, so, you know, influenza and pneumonia, this is a significant thing. And especially for people who have other complicating factors, say people who have heart disease, if you include that population, uh, then you might conclude that the mortalities may be more like 90,000 rather than 36,000. So influenza is interesting in uh, many cardiac, uh, cardiology departments are starting to study influenza now. And really it is vaccination which is said to be the primary method to prevent the spread and infection of influenza along with sort of general sanitation, washing your hands and so on. So I've been working on the flu for about 10 years now. Um, and a few years ago, I was involved with an effort to think about the effects of the swine flu. So in 2009, you might remember, there was a big scare about the swine flu that emerged in Mexico City um, <clears throat> in the spring. And that summer, I was actually traveling in Europe. Um, and I was going from Paris to London. Uh, so I was starting in Paris by train. Uh, and Paris is the, is the headquarters of the World Health Organization. So they make a big deal about uh, sort of public health problems in Paris quite a bit. So here's a sign in the train station about the swine flu. Uh, and one of the things it says is don't go to public places. Um, but you know, you're reading this sign in the train station, so <clears throat> what can I do? You know, I'm going to leave on the train. Uh, I'll do my best. And so I took the train from London to, sorry, from Paris to London through the channel. Uh, and then once I got to London, I'd actually never seen this before in a Western country, but there were some people wearing masks. So it's very common in Asia, but it's pretty uncommon in Western countries. This was a mask that someone hadn't thrown out. They just threw it on the floor. But um, you know, that was a sign of how concerned people were at that time about this swine flu. I visited uh, an agency in the United States government called BARDA. They're sort of in between the uh, CDC and the FDA. BARDA writes the contracts to the vaccine manufacturers. And I was going to talk to them about the swine flu. And that day, uh, a few articles came out. One of them was on <clears throat> a website 
that you know swine flu could kill up to 90,000 people this year, and maybe up to half the population could be infected in that year. So remember that number, half the population could be infected. I'll come back to that in a few slides. So to give you more history on influenza, maybe there were epidemics before 1918, but 1918 is the, maybe the first epidemic where we have pretty good data on the effect. Uh, and this is what used to be called the Spanish flu. Um, and that had a really high mortality. That was what we call H1N1. Uh, and then the next flu that had a, a big impact on us was the Hong Kong flu. That's what we call H3N2, and that was in 1968. And we tend to get, uh, as humans, either H1N1 or H3N2. So <clears throat> before essentially the end of World War II, uh, there was quite a bit of mortality from influenza and pneumonia. And basically, general overall public sanitation improved uh, in developed countries around the time of World War II. So the mortality decreased quite a bit by the mid-1940s. But there is still uh, an annual cycle to the mortality from influenza. So we, in, nor in the northern hemisphere, we have more flu in the winter and less flu in the summer. And this is actually something people still debate about. Why is it that we have more influenza in the winter? And one of the more uh, common theories now is that it has something to do with the lowered humidity in the winter that might be favorable for the virus, and it's probably unfavorable for your immune system, your lungs dry out, and so on, and maybe you're a little bit more susceptible to infection. So this is what the flu looks like. It's <clears throat> a virus, so its genetic material is inside this, uh, uh, it's encapsulated, and on the surface of this virus capsule are essentially two proteins that your immune system recognizes a little bit, H and N. And H is more important, so H is hemagglutinin, this is the crystal structure of hemagglutinin. This part down here is sort of in the membrane and your immune system doesn't recognize that much. And it's really this region up here that your immune system recognizes. And there are five what are called epitopes on this protein that your immune system recognizes. And they're shown in different colors here. So your immune system, when it uh, is encountering influenza, essentially sees these regions of this protein. <clears throat> and if you sort of look at a scientific discussion of influenza, you'll see a name like this. So the first part of it tells you this is influenza A. It could also be influenza B. Uh, but influenza A is sort of causes more disease in humans. The second part of the name tells you where this virus was first sequenced, where it was first collected. This is in that region, in this year, this is the the fifth virus that was collected. Uh, this is telling you the year, and then sometimes at the end they'll tell you the H and the N. So that's sort of the full scientific name of the swine flu. Um, and <clears throat> I'll focus on this part of the H. Okay, so how does your immune system recognize antigen? How does it recognize the flu? Well, <clears throat> you have B cells which make antibodies, and the antibodies are what protect you against the flu. And antibodies basically have this Y-shaped structure. So it's symmetric, and you have um, what are called the light chain and the heavy chain. And it's this region here or this region here that binds the flu. And this region actually has three pieces, a V, a D, and a J piece. So in your genes, you have several possibilities for the V region. You have several possibilities for the D region and several possibilities for the J region. You essentially randomly pick one of those. Those are put together, and that gives you, you, you your initial set of antibodies. So right now, you have about 10 to the different antibodies, and those are created by this VDJ recombination process, and that makes your set of naive antibodies. When you are attacked by something, so if you're infected with the flu, some of the B cells that are making these antibodies will recognize the flu, and they'll even evolve a little bit more, and you'll get some mutations in this region that make those antibodies recognize the flu even a little bit better. And that's how you eventually clear the flu, is these antibodies either cover the flu and kill it off, or they activate other, other cells or other, color, other compounds to come and kill off that flu virus. Now, ideally, you get a vaccine before you get attacked by the flu. Uh, and then your immune system is sort of primed and it's ready to go and it gets rid of the flu right away when you get attacked. <clears throat> and it's somewhat hard to predict what will be the uh, vaccine that will be best uh, 
uh, to protect us against the flu because we don't necessarily know what strain of the flu will become prevalent in the population next year. So this is important enough. There are cartoons made about this, right? And it's a little bit random uh, how good a job we can do on the flu. And this is partly because the flu mutates between when we pick the vaccine and when we get the vaccine. And it's also because, well, it's just somewhat hard to identify what's the likely strain that we will be infected with in the northern hemisphere. Part of the difficulty is the flu is still made in eggs. Uh, so there are hen's eggs that are used to grow the flu vaccine. And that takes some time. So essentially, we need to decide in around February what strains of the flu, usually what three strains of the flu, we'll put in the vaccine for the vaccine that we'll get around October in the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> it takes some time to adapt those strains to the eggs. So even if we know exactly what strain we want in the vaccine, a lot of times it doesn't grow in the eggs. So it has to be egg adapted. Uh, then it actually has to be grown in the eggs. And then it is harvested. It's sort of placed in big vats. Uh, and then it needs to be filled into either the single dose vials or the multi-dose vials uh, from the vats. So there's sort of three procedures and that all takes around six months or so. So that's why there's this long lead time. Uh, so we need to pick the vaccine sort of uh, early in the season that we'll get in the fall. <clears throat> So uh, I got interested in the flu when I personally got the flu shot, and maybe I won't focus on that, but there, the flu vaccine doesn't have 100% efficacy, and we'd like to make that efficacy higher. Um, so we'd like maybe to have a theory of how does the immune system respond to a uh, vaccine and then respond to a virus that might be a little bit different from the vaccine. And that's sort of what this graph is showing. So the idea is if you don't get a vaccine, then Typically, the immune system, in terms of some units, the immune system will produce a response. So even if you don't have a vaccine, most of the time you can clear uh, an infection, right? If you get a vaccine, then generally you should be able to clear that infection more quickly and more uh, effectively than if you, had, if you had not had the vaccine. So this would be sort of measles, mumps, rubella, the vaccines that the kids get. Those are all pretty good vaccines and you make a better immune response because you had the vaccine than you would have if you didn't have the vaccine. Now the x-axis here is a measure of distance between the vaccine and the virus. So if the vaccine and the virus are very different, so maybe you got vaccinated with tetanus and then you saw the flu, well, that vaccine doesn't have any effect. It's, you're just gonna make another response and you're not really influenced by the fact that you had a vaccine. If the virus is the same as the vaccine, well, then you're going to make a really good response, and it's better if you have the vaccine than if you don't have the vaccine. And as the virus becomes more different from the vaccine, the effectiveness of that vaccine will go down. There might even be a region where the effectiveness of the vaccine is negative, but for sure the effectiveness of the vaccine will go down as the virus gets more different from the vaccine. And this is what we'd like to be able to predict, and that's what I'm showing you here. Is, and I'll show you some data in a second, but the idea is we have a theory for how the immune system responds to a vaccine, and then how it responds to a virus that might be a little bit different from the vaccine. <clears throat> and we can understand some of the aspects of the immune system. So if you were vaccinated against a, a certain strain of the flu, how well do those antibodies recognize other strains of the flu? And typically, as the virus becomes more different from the vaccine, the ability of those antibodies to recognize different strains goes down exponentially. Within your immune system, there are mutations, right? So you make your initial antibodies by this VDJ recombination process, uh, and then that initial set of diversity, a few of those B cells are picked, uh, the ones that sort of recognize a little bit the influenza, uh, and they're further evolved in this process called somatic hypermutation. So there are a few mutations in the cells that make the antibodies. So in the DNA of the cells that make the antibodies, there are mutations. And on average, there are around nine mutations that occur in the B cells that best recognize the flu. And if you see the same virus, so you're vaccinated, you're gonna make nine mutations to kind of improve your antibodies. Uh, and then now you're already primed. So if you see that same flu later on, you won't make another nine mutations because you're already pretty good at recognizing that flu. You'll make around seven mutations. And as the virus gets more different from the 
vaccine, you'll have to make more and more mutations. And again, there's this region here where you're, the immune system will have to work a little bit harder because you had the vaccine than if you hadn't had the vaccine. But in general, we have an idea for the evolutionary process within the immune system. So as you are attacked by antigen, you have this initial set of antibodies that you sort of have all the time, uh, and a few of those recognize the virus somewhat. Those are improved by rounds of mutation and selection. So on the time scale of two or three times a day, you are turning over your B cells that are producing the antibodies and you're evolving your own immune system in real time against the pathogen. <clears throat> now, that's been a little bit theoretical, so let me try to make contact with uh, actual vaccines and real data. The theory that I'm talking about here is a form of what we call a spin glass theory or something from physics that uh, allows us to describe the landscape upon which these B cells evolve. And in your immune system, you have the antibodies that are recognizing the flu. Uh, and this is the hemagglutin again. This is the three-dimensional structure of the hemagglutin, and it's primarily these epitopes that your immune system is recognizing. And most of the time, your immune system focuses on one of these epitopes. So from your immune system's point of view, if the flu virus changes its amino acids in this epitope region, that'll make the antibodies bind less well. So that would be advantageous for the virus. So the virus is making mutations in these, all of these regions all the time at random. Those mutations that occur in the epitope are favorable for the virus. They allow the virus essentially to not be recognized as well by the antibodies, and those mutations are selected for. And that's why the virus changes from year to year. So <clears throat> here are some uh, data. What I'm looking at on the x-axis is this measure of distance between the vaccine and the virus. So we're looking at the fraction of amino acids that change in the epitope regions. And on the y-axis is the effectiveness of the vaccine. So it's essentially how good is that vaccine. If it's a perfect vaccine, the effectiveness would be one. If it's sort of a useless vaccine, the effectiveness would be zero. And the most important point is uh, these triangles, those are, ep are results from epidemiological studies. So it's the effectiveness as measured in some study of people usually in the northern hemisphere, how protective that vaccine was against influenza. And the most important point is those data correlate pretty well with this measure of vaccine distance. So this is a good measure of antigenic distance. The second point is that the standard animal model of vaccines for influenza is ferrets. And there are a couple ways you can get a, an antigenic distance measure out of a ferret. Uh, and those correlate with vaccine effectiveness in humans with a correlation coefficient about 0.4 or 0.5. Whereas this theory that I've been talking about has a correlation coefficient of about 0.8. So this is a pretty unique situation for the theory being more predictive than the animal models or uh, to, be more, um, uh, to be more humble, the theory provides some additional information beyond that which the animal models provide. And remember, that was sort of grand challenge number four. Can we, design, can we devise better tests for effectiveness of vaccines? And uh, usually you'd think that would be better animal models. And for example, that could be guinea pigs, maybe being a better animal model than ferrets. What I'm suggesting here is also that theory has some contribution. So you can have a better theory of how the immune system responds, and it can be more predictive of the vaccine effectiveness in humans than, for example, ferrets are. So we know animal models are not perfect, Maybe we could have some theory that you know, can tell us something beyond what animal models do. Now, uh, I've described how your immune system evolves against an antigen. That then puts pressure on the antigen, right? So the flu evolves from year to year. This is one of the reasons that the flu vaccine is updated on a fairly regular basis. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is the evolution of the flu since about 1968. So this is the evolution of the H3N2, so the, the Hong Kong strain. It emerged in humans in 1968, and it has evolved over the last 40 years. And you can plot that evolution in what I'm showing here is in a two-dimensional space. Um, so I'm, I'm taking all of the sequence data from the hemoglobin of the flu, uh, and I'm showing you sort of how you can describe that in two dimensions. And basically what happens is the flu exists as a cloud of points, and it sort of stays within that cloud for three to five years, and then it makes a dramatic change and shifts to a new cloud. 
So there are these clusters of the flu in sequence space, uh, and, you, and it evolves at a fairly regular pace from year to year. <clears throat> so we can predict this rate of evolution, and we can predict that the flu virus will change from year to year. We can't really predict where it will go towards, but we know it will go away from where it is now because there's immune pressure on it. <clears throat> Oops. So <clears throat> if we take this model that we have of the effect of vac vaccines seriously, then, well, we know that the vaccine is pretty effective here. You could also say if you were infected with a given strain of the flu, if you saw a somewhat different strain, that's just like being vaccinated. So you could either say this is a theory of vaccination or this is a theory of prior history of your immune system. If we take this seriously, <clears throat> if the virus is the same as the vaccine or if the virus doesn't change from year to year, then there's a lot of pressure on the virus. The immune system will recognize it and kill it off. If the virus evolves by this amount from year to year, then there will be no pressure on the virus from the prior history. So you would think just off the top of your head that this is roughly the amount of distance that the virus should evolve from year to year. And in these units, that's about 0.19. And if you measure the distance between the vaccine and the virus in the next year, it's about 0.16. So yes, the virus does seem to evolve from year to year away from the previous year's strain, which was also the vaccine in the prior year. year. So there is this evolution of the virus from year to year. We see that in this graph here or in this graph here. Um, and we see quantitatively that you can predict how much the virus should evolve based upon what we know about the ability of the immune system to recognize the virus. So there's pressure on, for example, this hemagglutinin molecule in the flu virus to evolve. And the virus basically evolves away from this pressure. Um, and the idea is that you have antibodies binding the hemagglutinin, and the flu is always making mutations. And those mutations which reduce the ability of the antibody to bind, that's favorable for the virus. And you'll see more of those viruses in the next year. So <clears throat> the virus can, for example, uh, place amino acids on its surface that bind less well to the uh, antibody, and that's favorable for the virus. So the simplest idea would be that the virus just puts charge on its surface. And we can see this in the history of the Hong Kong flu in people. So here I'm looking at the fraction of charge that's on the surface, and you can see that when the Hong Kong strain first went into people, the charge was fairly low, but it built up pretty quickly. Uh, and then when we stopped recognizing that epitope, uh, the charge decreased. So we see in people the effect of this selection of our immune system on the influenza virus. We can even see that in guinea pig studies. So we have some collaborators who did these studies in guinea pigs. And even in a few days in one guinea pig, the virus will reproduce and evolve. And the virus produces more charged epitopes on its surface than you'd expect just by random chance from random protein evolution. So there is this selective pressure on the influenza virus to evolve. If we have a crystal structure of an antibody bound to the virus, then we can do more detailed uh, types of calculations. We can do things from thermodynamics <clears throat> and calculate free energy changes. And that can tell us if we have this uh, antibody binding this antigen, what happens if some of the amino acids in the antigen change? <clears throat> and we can calculate, for example, uh, on average, how does the free energy change? And yes, the most disruptive thing the virus can do, the best thing the virus can do for itself is to put charge onto its surface. We can look at what are the substitutions that have occurred in humans, because lots of sequence data is collected. So even back in the 70s, uh, there were 50 to 100 sequences collected every year. Now there are probably 10 to 20,000 sequences that are collected from people who were infected from the flu uh, around the world every year. <clears throat> so in 1968, the idea is there's this Hong Kong strain of the flu that came into people, and immediately there were some mutations that would start occurring, and we would see some of those in the sequences. So the, <clears throat> the flu virus will mutate from uh, some amino acid to some other amino acid, and the idea is most of the time those mutations were towards amino acids that were, uh, those substitutions that we observe were towards mutations that were beneficial for the virus particle. So the virus is making random mutations, 
but the ones that benefit the virus are selected for, and that's what we see when we sequence the virus from people. <clears throat> and we can look at how those sequences, how those mutations emerged in the human population. We can try to model it based upon the calculations for a few different mutations. And, you know, sort of just roughly speaking, we're within 75% of how those uh, sequences evolved in humans from um, what we can predict from the models. <clears throat> Now we can try to incorporate this into a model of the entire world, right? So we can try to do something global here. So <clears throat> the virus evolves in people, but then it spreads from person to person through contact. Either one person touches a doorknob and then somebody else touches the doorknob, or one person sneezes on another person, right? This is how the flu uh, propagates. And <clears throat> this can either be through contact within a city, or it can be someone gets on a plane and goes somewhere else and then spreads it. Uh, so essentially, once the virus gets into a city that's 50,000 people or so, uh, someone there is going to get on a plane and fly somewhere else, and it'll spread throughout the world. So the virus is essentially impossible to contain because there is so much international travel these days. So we can make a model of people uh, contacting each other within cities, people flying between cities on planes, and of, and of the virus evolving within people. And what we would try to compare that model to would be data that the World Health Organization collects. So here are the northern hemisphere countries, and we're in the flu, people plot it versus weak. So this is January, this is December. So the flu rises in October, November, and it decreases in around February. Uh, so we would try to model these type of data, maybe average for northern hemisphere countries. <clears throat> so the crosses are the average of the previous slides data from the World Health Organization, and the uh, curve is what we can predict with an epidemiological model using this idea of the immune pressure on the virus. So people who have a prior history, they will not get infected as much as people who have no exposure to the influenza. And we can use that model to predict basic properties of the virus. So there's something called R0 in uh, immunology, and it's the idea of how many additional people can be infected by one infected person. Uh, and that's something that you can predict. Um, you can predict the diversity of the virus. So I mentioned that there are many sequences that are collected of uh, viruses in people, and you can see the diversity in those sequences. That's something that can be predicted. And maybe more from a practical point of view, we can predict how effective a vaccine can be. So if you vaccinate, say, 10% of the population, or 40% of the population, or 70% of the population, of course, if you vaccinate more of the population, that's better than if you vaccinate less. I'd probably we sort of know that already but we can now be quantitative, right? So if you vaccinate 10% of the population, that's, that's better than if you vaccinate nobody, um, and we can be quantitative about how effective that is. And we can say if the virus is a little bit different from the vaccine, how does the effectiveness of the vaccine decrease? Uh, and we can talk about if you vaccinate at different times. So this Mexico City emergence of the swine flu was one of the reasons we did these type of calculations. If the swine flu emerges in Mexico City and we want to vaccinate the U.S. population against that, if we vaccinated within 30 days or 60 days or 90 days of the emergence of the epidemic, of course, 30 days would be better than 90 days, but what, what would the effectiveness be? So we can be quantitative with these types of models. <clears throat> and we can even do a risk analysis. So we can say in sort of within a 95% confidence interval. So uh, if you're looking at the worst case scenario with a 95% confidence interval, if you don't give a vaccine, what fraction of the population would be infected, and it's about 50%. So remember on that CNN story, the CDC was saying up to 50% of the population could be infected. They didn't tell us what the confidence interval was there, but if they were using a 95% confidence interval, that's the right answer. Now, if there's a vaccine, or if there's a really good vaccine, that will lower the fraction of the population that will be infected in a worst-case scenario. So this can be used in sort of a public health planning or public policy type of setting. Now, the other question is, can we design the vaccine uh, to match what will likely infect us the next year? And it's really hard to predict where the vaccine will go, because basically, where the virus will go, because basically the virus just has to mutate. It just has to evolve away from the current strain. So your immune system recognizes the current strain, either because you got infected or because you got the vaccine. So you probably won't get infected with that same strain next year. So the virus will benefit from those mutations that move it away from the current strain. 
So, and there are many ways that the virus can mutate to just change. So it's hard to predict what strain will be likely dominant next year, but we can detect it. So the idea is what strain will be dominant in a large fraction of the population next year? A few people are actually getting that this year. So we can look at the small fraction of population that's getting some new strain this year, and that's uh, very likely to be what will infect most people next year. So I'll show you that in a little bit more detail. But first I'll give you a simpler example, which was the swine flu. That just sort of emerged in Mexico City. And if you remember, uh, it went from Mexico City to Texas, and then to the rest of the United States, and we actually spread it to the rest of the world. Uh, but you might remember New York thought that they were special and that they had a, a different strain of the swine flu than everybody else did. So the Yankees, you know, they needed a special vaccine. The New Yorkers needed a special vaccine. New Yorkers are special. So <clears throat> here's a graph kind of quantifying that. And yes, the Texas strain is different from the New York strain, uh, but I haven't told you what the units are here. The distance is actually really small. So it is true that the New York strain is different from the Texas strain, but according to your immune system, they're essentially identical. So really, uh, there was nothing special from the immune system point of view about New York versus Texas. So that's one of the things this modeling can do is quantify difference. Um, and here's, uh, again, this tells us the idea, though, about the emergence of new strains. So Texas was the original strain. There is this New York strain that emerged, but it's not really that different in this case. So the vaccine would be good against both of those strains. The vaccine was a Texas strain, and it would protect against the New York strain. Here's another example. This actually happened in the same year. So during that 2009, there was a new strain of H3N2 that emerged in British Columbia. And <clears throat> this is what, so everyone who wasn't getting the swine flu uh, had gotten this strain of H3N2 if they were getting influenza. But there was a new strain that emerged. And, and it emerged, it was first sequenced in the middle of March. And we could detect it as a new cluster at the end of March. So we could see the emergence of this new strain after just about two weeks of evolution. And this then is a general procedure for detecting those new strains. So <clears throat> here's what most people are getting. If you see a new cluster, it has to be sufficiently far. So New York wasn't far enough from Texas. It's not really a new strain, according to your immune system. This is far enough. So this, according to your immune system, would be a new strain. So uh, vaccination against this wouldn't completely protect against this new strain. <clears throat> and this new strain is radiating, it's growing. So there's some pressure on that new strain. So it's sufficiently far and there's immune pressure on that new strain. Those are essentially the criteria that tell us this is probably what will dominate in the population next year. So we can detect the emergence of new viral strains. Um, and this is, you can't really read this, but we tested this on the last 15 or so emergence of new strains. And we can always detect a year or two before it, it dominates the emergence of that new strain. And this is something that works a little bit better than what the World Health Organization, the CDC, currently do. So again, this is some additional information for public health authorities. So <clears throat> let me now turn to dengue fever. Um, and dengue fever is a disease that is endemic in about 100 or so countries in which about 2.5 billion people live. So it's primarily a tropical disease. Most of these countries are uh, around the equator. Um, for example, when I was in Brazil, <clears throat> many, essentially almost all of the scientists who were at the conference where I was had gotten dengue at some point during their life. Um, I was in Portugal a few weeks ago at a dengue conference, and actually there's some islands off Portugal that have had dengue now, and they spread it to the rest of Europe. So there are about 2,000 cases in Europe which is a small number of cases, but you know, there is some dengue in Europe. We have some dengue in Texas. We screen the mosquitoes during the summer. We always find a little bit. Uh, there's some dengue in Hawaii and some more in Puerto Rico. Um, so of course, if you travel, some chance you might get dengue. And certainly the people who live in these regions, they're very likely to get dengue. So there are about 100 million people who could get dengue every year. So it's a fairly common disease. Uh, it's spread by a mosquito. Um, and it's essentially like very high, it's like very serious high altitude sickness. So your plasma leaks out of your capillaries into your tissue or into your brain or into your lungs, uh, and you, <clears throat> you get this infection. It's encoded by this genetic region, uh, and there are about 10 proteins that form dengue. Uh, 
and you make an antibody response against some of them and a T cell response against others. And what's interesting to me is that there are four serotypes of dengue, and if you're infected with one, you're actually more susceptible to a serious form of dengue from the other three. So people really want a vaccine against all four serotypes of dengue. And here are some data from a clinical trial in Thailand. Now I've sort of summarized it over here in red. So <clears throat> what this is showing is that a vaccine given to people protects pretty well against some of the serotypes and not so well against some of the others. There was a recent much more comprehensive study by uh, Sanofi Pasteur of the dengue vaccine in about 3,000 people in Thailand, and it had only about a 30% effectiveness. So in particular, it didn't protect very well against dengue too. <clears throat> so people really want a four-component vaccine. They don't quite have one yet. And this issue is the non-uniform response against the four different serotypes of dengue. So essentially what's happening is your immune system uh, so we developed a, a theory to explain this. It's very similar to the theory that we use to understand your immune response to uh, influenza. There we were looking at antibodies and B cells. Here we're looking at T cells and T cell receptors. And essentially, some of the serotypes are just more recognizable than others, and you just make more T cells against those than against these others. So I said you have about 10 to the 8 different antibodies. You also have about 10 to the 8 different T cells. And overall, your immune system can maybe occupy up to about 5% of the mass of your body, right? You can't be all immune system. You're doing other things as well. So you can't just make more of all of your T cells. You select a few of the T cells that recognize that antigen, and you make more of those, and they try to kill off the pathogen. And, well, it's just possible for your immune system to recognize some of the serotypes more than it recognizes others. And you just make more T cells against those. So. That's the essence of our theory. Just by random chance, some of the serotypes will be more recognizable than others. You make more T cells against those, and that's why you get this immunodominance. And that's bad for the vaccine, because the vaccine then doesn't protect against the four different serotypes of dengue. <clears throat> so that gave us an idea, though, because this competition uh, for access to antigen occurs in your lymph nodes, and humans have hundreds of lymph nodes, basically around all your joints. So <clears throat> the idea is, what if you vaccinated in different places? So maybe if you vaccinated with serotype one here, two here, three here, four there, then you might make a good T cell response in those four different places in the lymph node clusters. And because you physically separated the antigen, now the T cells don't have to compete with each other, uh, and you make a more balanced response to the four different serotypes. And no one ever thought of that before for viruses. So we suggested it. Uh, and now there are at least four proof of principle experiments. So there were a couple experiments done on HIV. <clears throat> so HIV is also a virus. It's also somewhat controlled by T cells. So one of the experiments was of two different um, epitopes of HIV in mice. Uh, and when they vaccinated the mouse in the same place with the two epitopes, they got a much more narrow response than when they vaccinated the mouse in two different places. There was another experiment where they took three different clades of HIV. So maybe a U.S. clade, a European clade, and an African clade. And when they vaccinated in the same place, they got a more narrow T cell response than when they vaccinated in three different places in the mouse. So HIV is somewhat similar to dengue because it's a viral disease and it has multiple um, strains and it is somewhat controlled by T cells. So that's a very analogous type of experiment. And those experiments showed that this multi-site idea seemed to work. There was an experiment on dengue in monkeys and that showed that if you vaccinated the monkeys with the different serotypes in different places, you got a much more protective response than if you vaccinated the monkeys with those serotypes in the same place. And then finally, Sanofi Pasteur is the world's biggest vaccine company, uh, and they have a patent which cites our paper on the multi-site vaccination. So they have experiments that again show that the multi-site vaccination is more protective than the single-site vaccination against dengue. So, you know, I'm really hoping that there'll be more development of this multi-site idea, of course for dengue, but also for other uh, viral diseases that are somewhat controlled by T cells. The idea applies to cancer as well. So there are people who think about vaccinations for cancer, and that's where actually we first learned and got this idea for the multi-site vaccination. So let me conclude with a brief discussion of CRISPR. Um, <clears throat> and here, CRISPR is a genetic structure.
that was first found in bacteria uh, a while ago. And it's since been found in many other bacteria uh, and also in almost all of what are called archaea. Um, so these are uh, organisms that are similar to bacteria. They're often found in extreme uh, thermal conditions. And <coughs> CRISPR has a certain genetic structure. Basically, you have what are called spacers and repeats. Um, so you have the structure that looks like this. Uh, and it exists in the genome of the bacteria. So there's a genetic region of the bacteria that has a certain uh, type of structure which is called CRISPR. And <clears throat> it was only about five years ago that people realized this CRISPR is actually an immune system. So even bacteria have an immune system. So if you had taken a course on immunology or you read an immunology book, usually it'll say that jawed vertebrates have an adaptive immune system. And we need to revise that now. Uh, really, even bacteria have an adaptive immune system. So I'll describe a little bit about this immune system that bacteria have. So bacteria are infected by viruses. And when, when that happens, we call those viruses phage. So bacteria are attacked by phage. And that's sort of bad for the bacteria. So <clears throat> the bacteria has this CRISPR, which protects them against the phage. And the way that works is when a phage attacks the bacteria, it can get in the bacteria, can make many copies of itself, and then sort of explode the bacteria, and then those descendant phages go off and try to infect some other bacterium. Some small fraction of the time, the bacteria might actually be able to incorporate some of the genetic material from those phage into the CRISPR. And if that happens, if that same bacteria sees the same type of phage later, it's protected against it. So that, that phage, when it infects a bacterium that has the CRISPR, it's kind of suppressed and it isn't able to make copies of itself and really can't infect that bacterium. So this <clears throat> CRISPR protects the bacteria against the phage. They're not antibodies, but they kind of behave like antibodies. So this is an adaptive system because the bacteria is learning what phages are around and it's remembering that by putting genetic material from the phage in its CRISPR. So that CRISPR provides a historical record of what the bacteria have been infected with. It's adaptive because it's changing over time. And it's heritable, so when this bacteria divides, it copies its genome. And those two descendant cells will have copies of the genome and therefore copies of this CRISPR. <clears throat> so this is really like our immune system. There is this uh, adaptive immune system in the bacteria that the descendant bacteria inherit. So <clears throat> that was, it's an interesting story how that was discovered to be an immune system. It was discovered by people who make yogurt. And you probably know that there are bacteria in yogurt. This is one of the reasons people eat yogurt. It has some beneficial bacteria in there. Uh, and the guys who make the yogurt, uh, some of their yogurt, uh, some of the bacteria were dying and some of the other bacteria were not. And they really want the bacteria. And what they found was that the uh, bacteria that were dying did not have the CRISPR the bacteria that were surviving had the CRISPR. So there were, phage that were phages that were attacking these bacteria in the yogurt, and then some of the yogurt was protected against the phages by the CRISPR. So it was discovered by sort of very applied people. They discovered this very basic aspect of bacteria. <clears throat> and now there are uh, sort of several um, groups of people interested in CRISPR. One of them is interested in CRISPR because it's an immune system, and another group people is interested because, well, this is a way of affecting what genes are expressed in bacteria. So one of the things we looked at was if you have a population of the ba these bacteria, you can look at their CRISPR and that tells you what phages have attacked those bacteria over time. So you kind of have a historical record. You sort of have a library of the, uh, the experiences that these bacteria have had. Uh, and what you tend to see is that bacteria tend to share um, <clears throat> phages, they tend to share these records from the phages that occurred a long time ago, but the phages that are more recent, you see more diversity. So there's more diversity in the bacteria of recent phages than of older phages. So we sort of quantified that and we developed theoretical models to explain that. Uh, and this again is another example of the evolution of <clears throat> the immune system in the bacteria. So the immune system is evolving over time uh, and there's more diversity in the recent part of the immune system than the old part of the immune system. And this is because the bacteria are be attacked, being attacked by these phage. 
and this immune system is being selected for to match the phages that are in the environment. So to conclude, the immune system is an example of a real-time evolving system, uh, and your immune system responds to vaccines, and that protects you against viruses, but the protection depends on how different the virus is from the vaccine. And we can develop, we have developed models of that effectiveness of vaccines. The p epitope is a measure of this antigenic distance, and if we take that model, then we can protect how the virus will evolve from year to year. So the virus needs to evolve a certain distance in order to escape from an immune response. And we can also um, detect the emergence of new strains. We know that the new strain has to be a certain distance away from the current vaccine. Uh, and then that new strain has to have immune pressure on it. It has to be radiating outwards. And this is a tool that we can use to detect new strains and therefore decide what to put in the vaccine um, in February for what we're likely to be infected with in October. I mentioned dengue fever as an example where you have multiple serotypes or multiple strains and your immune system has a hard time covering all those strains simultaneously. But if you do multi-site vaccination, this can help your immune system learn to recognize all those strains. Um, I mentioned this also applies to HIV, for example. And then even bacteria have an immune system. And that immune system in the bacteria provides a record of the challenges that the bacteria have faced. And <clears throat> you can see the evolution of the phages and of the bacteria by looking at the sequences within this CRISPR region, this immune system of the bacteria. So with that, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. So, right, so uh, the general idea is there have been four or now five epidemic or pandemics of flus, and these are always quite different, quite new strains of the flu. So the first pandemic <coughs> was H1N1. Um, the, uh, another one was H3N2. And the typical way that these pandemics arise is you have a, a bird flu. We don't really get bird flus. Uh, so the bird flu is transmitted to pigs, and then the pigs transmit it to humans. So <clears throat> typically there is reassortment of the different genes in the flu, uh, and this reassortment can lead to a more virulent strain, also a strain we haven't seen before, so we can't recognize it, we can't suppress it. And then it spreads, uh, in the old days it would have spread through ship travel, um, uh, but now it spreads very quickly through airline travel. So the new strains of the flu, um, you can get quite different strains by this reassortment of different genes, or you can get a somewhat different strain just by mutation uh, of any of those genes in the flu particle. To really get a very different strain, you have reassortment. Uh, and this is related to the second question, so where do flus come from? Basically, they come from birds, so everything is a bird flu, but also everything is a swine flu because we don't usually get bird flus, we usually get things from pigs. <clears throat> and the simplest uh, theory is that Basically, where there are lots of birds and pigs and people is where new strains of the virus tend to emerge. And it's not 100% that this is Southeast Asia, but a lot of the new viral strains seem to come out of Southeast Asia from year to year. So this emergence of the new clusters that I showed, these new, see if I can find it, the new clusters here that are emerging <coughs> from year to year. So we have this new cluster emerging that's uh, going to be uh, often occurring in Southeast Asia, uh, and that e can either be from several mutations or it can be from a reassorbent of different genes uh, between different strains of the, the flu virus. <clears throat>
there a correlation between the match of, say, the vaccine from the previous year and how much evolutionary jump there is in the flu virus? For example, if you had a really good match from the previous year, will that cause the flu virus to jump into a whole new cluster? So the idea is generally you would think yes, um, but so let me try to find one of the graphs. But there's a little bit of a subtlety because really more people get the flu than get vaccinated. Because there's 7 billion people on the earth, 5 to 15 percent get the flu. So there are about 700 million people who get the flu every year. Now in the US, maybe half the population, a third the population gets vaccinated. So maybe 100 million get vaccinated. In Europe, I don't know, maybe 100 million. But the rest of the world, pretty much nobody gets vaccinated. So probably two to 300 million people get vaccinated every year. So there's probably more pressure on the flu from prior history of infection in people than there is from the vaccine. So the vaccine puts some pressure on the virus to evolve, but it's probably prior history that puts more pressure. So I would say essentially there's fairly constant pressure on the virus to evolve from year to year. If you have a really good match of the vaccine, there's a little more pressure, but you know it's maybe an additional 200 million people versus the 700 who got the flu anyway. So it, it seems like there's some some viruses that uh, that mutate very frequently. So the the vaccine's always chasing a, a moving target, but then there are other viruses that don't seem to mutate quite as frequently. So what, what's the difference between those and what's going on there? So in general, single-strand RNA viruses, just from a <clears throat> biochemical point of view, they, they have a higher mutation rate. Uh, and then, for example, bacterial pathogens have a low mutation rate. So in bacteria, first of all, it's probably DNA, so it's more stable than RNA. It's double-stranded, so it's more stable. And then bacteria even have an error correction machinery, just like we do. So the mutation rate in bacteria might be 10 to the minus 10 per base per replication. And the mutation rate in a single-strand RNA virus, like flu or HIV, might be more like 10 to the minus 5 per base per replication. So there can be a huge difference in the mutation rate in pathogens. So, so all the childhood vaccines that work really well those are essentially against pathogens that don't mutate very much. That's why those back, that's why those vaccines work really well. So measles, mumps, rubella, they pretty much don't vaccine. They don't. Uh, those vaccines don't lose effectiveness because the, those pathogens don't evolve much. <clears throat> the flu evolves from year to year. So this is the flu evolving over the last 40 years, um, <clears throat> and your immune system can protect against other strains within one cluster, but not really against strains in an adjacent cluster. So the flu has this structure uh, such that when the, when the polymerase copies the flu, it makes lots of mutations. So there are really different types of pathogens. Some evolve not so much, some evolve quite a bit. Uh, in, the, in the last couple of years, there was one flu virus that uh, became somewhat um, uh, controversial because they were doing work on, I guess, some very virulent form of, of, the, of the flu. They were trying to publish their work. You're supposed to be able to replicate, and there were issues as to whether or not you could actually share samples on these things. Are the mathematical models actually uh, a solution to that problem? Um, so <clears throat> there are two sets of experiments that were a little bit controversial. The one before what you're talking about was uh, people actually exhumed victims of the Spanish influenza, and we now know the sequence of H1N1, uh, and really anyone can go out and synthesize H1N1, that Spanish influenza. The experiments you're talking about are, there is something called um, the bird flu, <coughs> which is actually H5N1, and not that many people have died from it, but if you measure in a certain way, half the people who are infected die. So the mortality rate is really high, even though only maybe 300 people have died. So that bird flu <coughs> doesn't transmit from person to person. There may be two or three examples, but basically doesn't transmit from person to person. And 
people are very concerned. If that flu really could transmit from person to person and it killed half the people, you know, then we would have three billion people on the earth instead of seven. Um, so <clears throat> people anticipate, uh, people try to anticipate where will the, how will the virus evolve person to person transmissibility. So there are a number of experiments that have been done to see uh, how could you evolve that virus so that it would transmit from person to person. Um, and two experiments like that uh, have been published now. Uh, they were done in ferrets, so they're trying to look at ferret to ferret transmission. So there was a, a study done in Wisconsin and then a study done, I think, in Japan. Uh, there are also other studies that you don't hear about. Uh, and the idea was if we could predict how that virus will become person to person transmissible, then we can make a, a vaccine against that strain now in the anticipation of that maybe happening in the future. <clears throat> the problem is I mentioned the really many ways the virus can evolve. So the two experiments that were published, the virus evolved ferret to ferret transmission in two different ways. So basically those were not particularly helpful experiments. There are probably many ways that the virus can evolve person to person transmissibility. So um, you know, there are many things that could happen and really we can worry about all of them, but most of them aren't going to happen. So uh, one strategy people are thinking about is can we, get, can we get faster at designing the vaccine? So instead of designing the vaccine in eggs, can maybe we grow it in cells or something else that's a little bit faster? So either cell-based technologies or even cell-free technologies for designing vaccines, having a very rapid ability to respond to new strains, that's something that's probably universal. And that's something that's a lot of effort on um, these days. Yeah. You mentioned that the phages influence the DNA sequence of the bacteria the, yep. in, the, in the CRISPR so they can pass on that information to their progeny. How about in the case of the human? We have a major histocompatibility locus and a minor histocompatibility locus. Does the in infections that humans have, do they modify the DNA in these histocompatibility right, locus? Right, so I would say um, <clears throat> in the CRISPR case, it's sort of very direct. The bacteria actually incorporate part of the genetic material from the phage, and that then protects the bacteria against those phage. We don't necessarily incorporate part of the pathogens that are affecting, infecting us, but we um, can evolve our immune system. So <clears throat> the immune system that people have in Europe is different from the immune system that people have in South America. So the ability of those two different groups to fight dengue is a little different. So the people in Europe, for example, have different VDJ possibilities than the people in South America. And then also <clears throat> there's different regulation of the VDJ regions that are used uh, of the people in Europe versus the people in South America. So, and the South Americans will pass on their VDJ possibilities to their progeny and the Europeans will pass on their VDJ possibilities to their progeny. So it's kind of a slower process, but yes, different peoples have different um, VDJ regions within their immune system, either for B cells or for T cells and those are passed on to their progeny and those must be selected for uh, over time, but it's kind of less direct than what's happening with bacteria and CRISPR. I want to make a comparison with cancer, which is probably ridiculous, but you know, there's this great search for a cure for cancer and at times there seem to be a great movement to achieve this. I think now we realize cancer is just too varied and we'll never have a cure for cancer as such. But do you think there will ever be a cure for the flu? Will we ever get to the point where we can come up with something where we will not have every year an outbreak of flu? Right, so <clears throat> there are people who are thinking about this and one of the, uh, so most of all the vaccines against the flu basically are inducing B cell response antibody responses against this region up here. And basically the virus has evolved so that it can change this region up here. So the virus has kind of evolved to survive. So it puts these epitopes out there, your immune system recognizes it, but the virus can evolve these epitopes and it runs away essentially. 
Um, and that's really why the virus still exists. So there are people who talk about, well, there's not much evolution that happens down here. Why don't we try to make antibodies against this region down here, and then that'll be a universal flu vaccine because there's no evolution down there, and that they never really say we'll eliminate the flu, but at least we'll have a universal vaccine. Um, <clears throat> so I'm on the NIH study section to select proposals for new vaccines, and this is one of the things we see a lot now are proposals for these universal vaccines. <clears throat> Only a few people seem to have these universal vaccines, these universal um, antibodies. Um, so there are a couple points. One is maybe these uh, antibodies also bind proteins that most of us have, so that wouldn't be a good vaccine. You generate a lot of autoimmune disease. Another point is I would say probably there's not much evolution down here because right now there's not much pressure. But if you started vaccinating against these regions down here, it'll probably start evolving down there too. Uh, and then third, to really eradicate the flu, the flu doesn't just infect humans, but it infects birds and pigs. Probably we'd have to vaccinate the birds and the pigs too. And maybe you could do the pigs, but the wild fowl, you know, they're going all over the place. So you'd have to put out a lot of bait to vaccinate a lot of birds uh, to really eliminate. So for a single host disease, I think you have a chance of you know, getting rid of it, maybe with polio, for example. But for the flu, because there's this wildlife reservoir, I think it would be really hard to actually eradicate. 